Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Kim from What the Flick, The Young Turks, and soon my very own show that'll be starting in July, so keep an eye out for that. It's been a while, but we have a new interview for you. This time it's the makers of Queen of the Sun, What Are the Bees Telling Us? A documentary about the history of man's mutually beneficial relationship with honeybees and the frightening phenomenon known as colony collapse disorder, where mass numbers of bees suddenly desert or never come back to their hive. So why should you care? Well, if you enjoy eating food for pleasure and for living, you better care, since without plant pollination by honeybees, we wouldn't have roughly 70% of the food the world eats, including apples, broccoli, citrus, soybeans, and grapes. I had a talk with Queen of the Sun's director, co-producer and co-editor Taggart Siegel, as well as co-producer and co-editor John Betts about the movie, bees' role in pollinating crops, colony collapse disorder and what might be causing it, how to handle bees, and a lot more. This video is just part of that interview, but you can find the interview in its entirety at the links in the video annotations and in the info section. So here's Taggart Siegel and John Betts of Queen of the Sun, What Are the Bees Telling Us? We're going to start with a boring question. So, so how was it that you got uh, interested in, in, uh, in taking on this topic? And it wasn't until I came across an article, I think it was in E! Magazine, where, where they were talking about colony collapse disorder, and this was in 2007. And it was that time when, when this phenomenon called colony collapse disorder, where the bees disappear and they, they don't come back to the hive. And it was something that really disturbed me because I found out that it was one of the most important issues of our time, the fact that honeybees keep us alive. And there was a quote that's been disputed by Einstein that said, if, if honeybees disappear from the surface of the earth, man has four years to live. And that really frightened me. That was like, okay, this is my next film. I'm going to make this. And uh, I haven't really s stopped. It's been in three years of complete um, fascination and um, a sort of passion to find out what's going on. Um, I came on, on board to work with Taggart um, from a filmmaking standpoint, just wanting to be a part of this project, understand um, more about the bees, and it's been really a learning process for me. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to be in the edit room with Taggart, to be on shoots, and to just be on this journey of discovery about bees and the beehive. And, and um, you know, it's you discover something about bees when you're filming them all the time, the relationship between bees and beekeepers, and and it really draws you in, in a, in a way, and we really tried to create that with the film. And, and what were you guys, uh, your perceptions of bees bef before starting the movie and, uh, and afterwards? Well, for me, I didn't know very much about honeybees, that they were the, you know, one in every four bites that we take is contributed to the honeybee, and I had no idea that they were so important to keep our crops going and our ecosystems going. It's it's just such an incredibly global issue when you when you really dig into it, and you know, headlines, media, all of these sort of very sensational approaches to the topic and, and a lot of information that's getting out to the public but very little of it very in depth you know you ask people have they heard about the bees like oh yeah i heard about the bees they're dying off you know and that's kind of the extent of it no one really understands the factors that are coming it's it's certainly a mystery um writ large but there's so many factors that go into it is there a scientific consensus yet on what is causing it or is it just i mean the movie lays out that there's multiple factors but is I, has there been sort of like consensus about what it actually is? Not at all. I mean, I, th I think they're trying to, there's been articles, there's been scientific research that's saying, saying that it could be a fungus or, or a virus, and they've kind of isolated it, but it's not conclusive, that evidence. So it still comes down to these neonicotinoids that are neurotoxic. They they affect the the memory of the of the bees they can't navigate back to the beehive i mean they they ban this neonicotinoid in many countries because it's so dangerous so toxic to the bees so that's one contributing factor but if you think about it as a kind of a, a cocktail that we've created from trucking bees across the country to pollinate all the monocultures that we've set up we feed them corn syrup to, while they're on these trucks we give them antibiotics, which really affects their immune system. And so with all these pathogens and viruses and pesticides, we're contributing to the downfall of, of the honeybee. So 
for me, it's it's like the combination of all these things that's creating something much larger than what used to happen to honeybees when they would die out. There's obviously a lot of need to look further into colony collapse, and we've been looking for a number of years, and, and I applaud the efforts of, of scientists and beekeepers and everyone who's doing the research. Um, but so many people are looking at one specific, you know, what's that one thing that causes colony collapse so we can develop the cure so business can go on as usual, tends to be the approach you see. And, and sort of our take on it after the research we've done in making Queen of the Sun is business probably can't go on as usual. There's, there's a systemic problem here in the way we grow our food in monocultures and in the way we're keeping bees and the industrialization and overbreeding and what we're breeding for. And it's just so many different factors that are going into it that it's not just a simple like silver bullet, you know, as they would say, or giving them a shot or a medication that's, you know, that's just going to cause probably a bigger collapse down the road, you know, as those factors stack up. I mean, I was very surprised to hear all about uh, the almonds. And about, I mean, so if you could explain a little bit more, so is it that like without the almond crops, there would be kind of like no domestic bee breeding or? Well, the almond crops are just a, a sort of an example of monoculture farming. So we grow tons of our food this way. You know, corn is grown in these huge monocultures and apple orchards and cherry orchards and cranberry bogs. A lot of it, it's, it's all done in these massive, fields you know the almond trees in central valley of california there's enough acreage it's the size of rhode island of one crop and when you've got that much of one crop together you've created this sort of like feast for pests it's i mean it's this perfect this the pests that all like the almond trees are just going to mm. like multiply and multiply there and so you have to spray just you know an immense amount of pesticide to keep that at bay so that's the beginning of the problem is that you've got the system that's already so artificial and then if you add on to that that bees need a diversity of blooms um, in order to survive and if you've got an almond field where all there is is a bloom for two weeks and then this whole swath of land for hundreds of thousands of acres doesn't have flowering plants you're not gonna have bees there so the 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 system that we've created is part of that problem, this trucking of bees into these crops. And it's not just the almonds, they go to the almonds first, because those are the first bloom in February of all these major crops, but then they travel northward up into the orchards in Oregon and Washington, um, and the same thing on the East Coast. And 75% and of all commercial bees come to the Central Valley in California to do this crop. So it's that there's diseases that are mixed around. It's, it's, it's sort of a capsule, if you will, a microcosm on sort of an epic scale of, of, of all of the problems that are going on with bees. I see this kind of monoculture, like Michael Pollan says in the film, like it all comes down to monocultures. Like that's why we have these systems in place. That's why we have to truck the bees in. That's why we have to use intensive amount of pesticides. We've destroyed, as Raj Patal says in the film too, who, who wrote the book Stuffed and Starved, that we literally have to destroy these vibrant ecosystems and replace it with synthetic fertilizers and chemicals that were created out of war, basically. And we've created this system that is insane because we're, we're destroying these vibrant ecosystems that need diversity. And it, it's like, it's all out of money and production and, you know, kind of that factory industrialized farming. And that's really, um, if the bees are the thing that collapses, all those farms will collapse too. What has been sort of big, agric big agriculture's response to colony collapse? Well, they, they know, obviously, that colony collapse is a problem. Beekeepers have been making a huge kind of statement about colony collapse. And, and most beekeepers, even the commercial ones, are very, very upset about the die-offs because it's a huge problem for them. But the solution that's being offered is to change the way the plants grow so that they wind pollinate, for instance. So we don't need the bee. So the solution is, oh, if bees are dying off, let's change our crop, let's keep our system, let's keep this monoculture system that is so profitable and makes so much money and supports this agribusiness, you know, this international agribusiness. But let's change the structure of the genetics of these plants so that they wind pollinate. So that's what they're trying to do with the almonds right now, is create a wind pollinated almond. It's what they've done, you know, with 
other things. And, and it's, you know, so instead of looking at the problem and what's causing it, they're just trying to sidestep it. And ultimately, we're going to see just a much bigger crisis because of that. I, I was thinking that it seems like bees kind of have like the almost like their same reputation problem as sharks <laughs> where it's, uh, people just think of them as something unpleasant uh, you say, yeah. oh you know there's going to be less bees around people would probably say oh great yeah you know mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. how what do you think are, are sort of have you found are, are good ways to kind of help change this kind of this uh, this bad reputation bad rap that they're getting? <laughs> well you know it's true that you know, we've got these movies you know the killer attack of the killer bees and this this whole sort of like in entertainment mm -hmm. culture where bees are sort of a thing that a writer would use to write in to create you know fear and it's 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 kind of like this universal thing everyone's scared of bee stings and and the reality is that most of those bee stings are actually coming from wasps or yellow jackets. And people um, don't understand the difference between the two. And yellow jackets and wasps are carnivores. They go to your lunch meat at your picnic. And they're, they're much more um, just generally aggressive um, and mm. hostile because they'll even come and attack beehives, for instance. But honeybees are much smaller. They're fuzzier. They're, they're just a completely different look. And they're much more interested in just collecting pollen and nectar. I think it's just a huge misinformation thing. And, and people, if they realize that bees are really out to get pollen and nectar from flowers, that they're only gonna sting you for self-defense because they die when they sting you. And that's only gonna be in the very rare circumstances where you're pinching them under your arm or you know something, an accident, or you're standing right in front of a beehive or you've stepped on one or you know something that's aggressive. So I was wondering like all, all the people that you see in the movie who, you know, these beekeepers who don't wear masks <laughs> or don't even wear shirts and t tend not to wear gloves, which seems strange to me. So is that because honeybees are just less aggressive or is it that these people have just learned learn the skill of being around them and what scares them or is it something that certain people are just kind of born with because I think in, in the movie it seems this idea of like kind of a lineage and this proud tradition of, of there being beekeeping right. people and that they're special people. Uh, <laughs> well you know that's an interesting question I, I think uh, I mean possibly all three are true but I think that certainly it's about a relationship that a beekeeper develops with their beehives and if you ask any beekeeper they'll tell you that different hives have different personalities it's a very strange thing about honeybees they're a super organism and they communicate so closely together some hives are real angry and pissy and other hives are just friendly and easygoing and you know and these are just the personalities of beehives and and the beekeeper knows that and they'll know how to approach the different hives they know what sets them off when the weather patterns are going to be such that you don't want to go near those hives and so a lot of the beekeepers that we filmed with were very conscious of that and the reason you know because i wouldn't recommend just anybody go up to a beehive obviously without any protection on but a lot of these beekeepers have years and years of experience they know all of their hives and, and everything's very respectful very delicate i mean gunther hawk in the film there's there's a, a scene where he has a bee crawling on his nose during the interview and at the end of the interview he just nudges it off you know and it's just calm movements it's or subtlety and respect or Uvan Ushard who who is performs in the in the film dramatically like he he has no shirt on he's chanting to his bees but he also and I didn't plan this at all he takes a frame of bees out probably a thousand bees on that frame and he just brings it up to his mustache and starts tickling his the bees with his mustache. Now that is something that it's just like, am I really seeing this? And and even like Sarah Marpelli who dances with 12,000 bees on her body and she's like, you know, dancing for an hour and a half. And she did get stung. Uvan Ushard didn't get stung, but she got stung about 15 times, but she just kept dancing. I mean, you could get stung you know, Uvan Ushard says up to 500 times before it could kill you. I mean, it, everybody's different, but beekeepers get stung, and it's it's the reality. But the ones that are really calm and respectful of the bees, they pick that up. And so I never wore gear, or you didn't wear gear, when the beekeeper didn't wear gear. So mm -hmm. here's this camera, and you do go up to the hive, and it can be kind of like, oh, God, are they going to like this? But if I'm calm, they kind of pick that up. And they didn't think I was going to attack them. So, so that's what helps. But if a beekeeper is wearing gear, 
we're going to wear gear 